Over the last few years, I've run hundreds of races. I've run thousands of training runs. I've listened to loads of podcasts. I've read loads of books, all of them behind the science of effective recovery. And these are the six evidence-based recovery methods that I've built into my routine to help me get the most out of my sessions and to avoid getting injured. Shona and I also want to share with you five recovery tricks that took my chronic recovery routine to the next level that you can begin to implement in your routine today. Let's get started. Right Shona, we're talking about chronic recovery. So let's unpack a little bit what we mean when we're talking about chronic recovery versus acute recovery. Yeah, awesome. Lindsay. I like to use those two definitions. Acute recovery is really where the things that we can do every day. So straight after a session, what are the important things we need to be doing as you finish your session and for the rest of the day? And then the chronic recovery is really what we're doing in a, in a, in a maximal or a, a wider sense of the, of the term. So what we do in a weekly sort of sense or within our programs and how we build that into uh, our big programs and our 12 weeks or our four weeks sort of micro cycles and building up to the 12 weeks from there. Linz, you mentioned six evidence-based recovery methods that, that you perhaps use. Maybe tell us a little bit more about those. So essentially what I do as I get home from every run is that I never run all the way to my house. So I will stop my watch and I will walk to the house so that I am effectively cooling down. When I walk through the front door, I then go to the kitchen and I mix myself a drink or get some water and grab some fruit or something to eat. And then I head out to the veranda where I will then do a, a stretch every day. Um, and then once I feel like I'm cool enough, that's when I will then move off and go and shower and get ready for my day. And then at some point during the day when I'm having some downtime or if I'm reading a book, I will then typically get into my compression boots um, and do between 20 and 40 minutes um, most days of the week, depending on, on um, how much time I've got available to me. Awesome. So let's unpack that a little bit. So let's go into why recovery. So first, straight after our sessions, why are we looking at recovery? Can you just give us a little bit of the science? Uh, not, not so much science, but just um, in layman's terms, what we are trying to do as soon as we are finished with the session that we are busy with, especially when it's been a hard or a particularly long session, is we want to start the process of restoration. So we physically are looking at repairing the body giving it the space to get over the work that we've done, but very importantly, then to build on top of that. So our bodies repair the damage, but we don't want to stop there because the body's like, hang on, how can I make myself better prepared to cope with the next training load that this guy's going to give me? And so we want to then improve the system. And that ultimately is the act of recovery. It's not simply as a dictionary states as a return to health or return to a specific state. That's step one of the recovery. Step two of the recovery is to improve, enhance, get better so that over time we get fitter, stronger, faster. So one of the things I really like to do as well is the, the cool down walk, right? So just to, to allow your heart rate to come down, really cool down. That would be a non-negotiable for me. And then the second non-negotiable you mentioned is, is getting something to eat and drink at that, at that point. What, do you, what are the things that you do straight after a run with eating and drinking? Yeah, so my typical routine for easy runs or shorter runs would be to get myself a, a cold glass of water and a banana and some other piece of fruit. When I have trained harder or if I've had to train really early, I will then go and make myself either a cup of coffee or um, get some milk that I'll, I'll put some cocoa powder into or chocolate milk um, and make myself a slice of toast with peanut butter and honey and then perhaps a banana. So that's typically if I've done a long run or a really hard run or as I said if I've had to wake up at like 4 30 in the morning and then I've had absolutely nothing before I've exercised and then I'll head out onto the um, the, the veranda or Porsche and I will eat that while I am stretching. The reason we're wanting to eat is that we're wanting to replenish the fuels that you've used during your training so you've You've started your training, you've now depleted all those fuels that you have. And as Lindsay mentioned, we want to get ready for our next sessions. Lindsay, you mentioned stretching. Um, 
why do you like stretching? I, I want to give you my input on that, or maybe perhaps what the science says, but what's the reason for you that you enjoy doing a bit of a stretch on your veranda or on your porch after a run? So the main reason why I stretch is because I want some space between exercising and when I jump in the shower. Otherwise, I literally feel like I shower and then 10 minutes later, it feels like I've just finished exercise again. So that's ultimately the most important reason why I do it. It also buys me the time to get in the, the feels that I need. And what I find personally is that over time, it doesn't impact me so much today and tomorrow and the next day. But what I find is over time, if I don't do that stretching, I tighten up, I feel uncomfortable, I feel like um, a coiled spring when I'm, when I'm running and effectively I just feel like I lose range of motion over time. Let me give the scientific side of it is that essentially from a science perspective static stretching doesn't have a good there's no correlation between static stretching and your ability to get injured or your risk of injury right so there's no correlation to that a lot of people the way i grew up anyways was told oh if you static stretch you're going to reduce your risk of injury so it's not necessarily for that but lindsay's purpose of his static stretching is really effective because I highly doubt you're doing a, a mobility session in between your runs. So it's a great way to ensure that you're getting good mobility and making sure that you're fo following through with that as opposed to putting in a specific mobility session uh, in the week. So an effective way, but essentially, I think my point here is just to make sure that people need to find the modalities that work for them. So if, static, if you enjoy static stretching, go ahead and do that. I personally don't static stretch after a run, but I have set specific mobility sessions that I do within a week anyways. Yeah, and I think on that note, one of the really important things here is that I never stretch before I run. I am always doing the static stretching at the end of a workout when my muscles are warm, when my joints are mobile. And so I, I don't think that I'm inducing that stretch reflex that you get um, when you are, are stretching beforehand. And before exercise, especially hard sessions, I do try to do some mobility so that I can get my body moving and feeling better before I do those sessions. Lindsay, you mentioned the compression boots that you use. Tell us a bit about those and yeah, interested how those work. I find that it creates the space for me to have some downtime, um, to mentally relax. And I find that especially after traveling and after races that when I have spent between 20 and 40 minutes in those boots that I just feel really relaxed, my muscles feel good and I feel light on my feet. That's very interesting. I quite like uh, doing some foam rolling. Not the foam rolling where you lie on the floor because same thing with traveling. So I have this very mobile uh, foam roller that I use and I can put it in my hand luggage for when I'm traveling and just I guess a similar sort of mechanism but, but, but again just different. So again the key point here I think is just that Find what works for you because from a subjective point of view, if you're feeling better and feeling light on your feet, you will feel like you are recovering better as well. Absolutely. And I think the, the function of both of those, whether you are doing some sort of um, rolling or massaging or compression socks or compression boots, the, the principle there is to improve circulation through the muscles and to help with the recovery process. Um, I guess in terms of the science, one of the things around the compression is that if there is actual damage there, like you have after doing a marathon, for example, that that compression controls the inflammatory process and so in theory cuts down your recovery time down the line. Another tool that I think we should talk about but that I find extremely painful and would never subject myself to is ice water immersion. That is a modality that has been used by elite athletes in particular over many, many years. Yeah, it's something uh, in my early days as a sports scientist, I would force the teams that I worked with to, to get in an ice bath after a game or, or after a session. And again, it just the science has, has moved beyond that uh, to, to essentially the point now where we are understanding that that cold water immersion straight after a session actually inhibits your adaptation. So the recovery process is there for a reason. Your body goes through an inflammatory process and essentially makes itself stronger. And if you are then inhibiting that, you're inhibiting your, your adaptation to that training session. And so, yeah, we have moved away, perhaps, I think, a little bit from cold water immersion straight after a session, but is there a time where you think it 
could be useful for an athlete? Yeah, just listening to you talk there, literally what I thought to myself is that's probably the kind of thing then that is really effective in a multi-stage race or in um, competitions where you've got to do multiple races in a short period of time because by then you've got the adaptation you need. What's much more important is being ready to go again the next day or in a couple of days time. So that sorts out the acute recovery, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis or straight after our sessions. We also mentioned chronic recovery. Linz, talk to us a little bit about your principles and how you run chronic recovery in a person's plan. So look, there are multiple layers to that chronic recovery and making sure that we can sustain training over a long period of time. But I like to break it down into what's the most important. And there are effectively three things that for me form the base of what our recovery is. And the better we do those three things, the bigger that base is, the higher the point will be that we can achieve at the top. Okay? And those fall into sleep, nutrition, and rest. Okay, so we really, in our peak periods of training, when I'm working, whether it's with elite athletes or whether we're working with someone towards a specific goal, we always hit these periods of six to 10 weeks where we're really putting in a big effort, doing the most training you've ever done, for an example, and that's the period we really wanna dial in, making sure we're eating well, we are sleeping well, and we are making sure that we have some days in there to mentally and physically take a break from the training that we're doing. All right, Lynn, so let's unpack that a little bit. Sleep being the first one, and, and there is a lot of focus on sleep in and around the literature at the moment. And I think the key points there are you want to ensure that you're getting enough sleep and you want to ensure you're getting good quality sleep. What are some of the aspects around that? Why does that help us in our recovery? During sleep is actually when the majority of that recovery takes place. So while you are sleeping, you have a really large surge of hormones, in particular growth hormone and testosterone. Now that typically peaks out somewhere around between midnight and 2 a.m. in the morning. And what's interesting is that we need to go through a couple of sleep cycles before we get that proper growth hormone and testosterone release. And so if we're not going to bed early enough, that actually compromises the peak hormone release and therefore we don't get the recovery that we should be getting even if we're sleeping enough hours. Yeah, exactly. And look, I'm a, I'm a realist. I, uh, I know that people aren't getting enough sleep anyways. Life happens, kids, studies, work, it's all going on. But what are the ways or what are some of the things we can do to improve our sleep? You know, everyone says, oh, well, I'm definitely sleeping well. But what are some of the aspects that we can do that are in our control to ensure that we are getting good quality sleep as well? Yeah, so there are a couple of simple, not necessarily easy things, but there are a couple of simple things that we can do to try and make sure that we improve that recovery. Now, one of them is getting into bed a little bit earlier. Okay, the literature is quite clear and the research shows that the earlier we get into bed before 10 o'clock, so it's at about 10 o'clock that we start to compromise that hormonal release that takes place uh, between midnight and, and 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, so again, it's not always practical advice, but I'll go back to my point is that typically this is a six to eight week period where we're really working towards an important goal. So in that short term, try and prioritize 15 minutes earlier, 30 minutes earlier. So don't get too fixated on a time. Be cognizant of the fact that you want to get into bed a little bit earlier. Okay. Then in terms of improving that quality of sleep, probably the single biggest thing you can do to improve the quality of your sleep is to get off screens. So cell phones, tablets, computers, and television. All of those things emit blue light. Now that blue light actually tricks your brain and your brain thinks that you are going to sleep during the day and that compromises how deeply and how quickly you will go into deep sleep. Of course, we are seeing now that devices have blue light filters and so on and those do help and if you have to be on an, a device until you go to sleep, you must make sure that you put on that maximum blue light filter but the preference is to read a book, talk to a significant other, 
but be off those devices for 30 minutes before you go to sleep. The second thing that you can do to really improve the quality of your sleep is to have a really quiet, dark environment. Cool is a bonus, but if it can be quiet and dark, and what do we mean by that? We don't have a TV on standby with a red light. We don't have a cell phone in the room that has a constantly flashing light, and we don't have a bright alarm clock that really makes a lot of light. And the reason for that is because we evolved to have thin membranous eyelids so that if something happened at night, we would be able to pick up that things were happening around us. And so we want that room to be as dark and as quiet as possible. And if you follow those things, go to bed a little bit earlier, get off your screens, and be in a quiet, dark environment, you will radically improve the quality of your sleep. That's very interesting. I live in a one bedroom studio apartment, and so uh, there is a little light on the TV. There is obviously uh, noises from, you know, fridges and so on. Um, and so I have bought myself a set of eye patches that are amazing. They're nice and soft and squishy. They, they don't move too much while I sleep, and also some earplugs as well. So if that is the case, there are things that you can put in place to really ensure that quality of sleep. Let's go into nutrition. You mentioned nutrition as another part of this, this space. And now we're not necessarily talking about our post-training nutrition. We covered that already, but really just putting in the good building blocks for our training uh, blocks as well. Absolutely. And if we are providing good quality nutrients, in between the training sessions we are a preparing ourselves to have enough energy for when we get to the training sessions but very importantly we are providing the building blocks that allow the body to repair itself and to improve so that we can continue to get better we don't dig ourselves into this hole of chronic fatigue that keeps building up but we can actually make sure that we are recovering properly and ready for the training sessions that are coming. You mentioned this this pyramid of yours and if we get that base right so the wider we can make that base you know then we can really make that pyramid nice and high with other aspects that might help our recovery. A lot of people are using supplementary forms of compression garments and massage and so on um, some active recovery I guess in both of our experience, we see so often that people are inverting that pyramid and making the, the massage and the compression garments the most important aspect of their recovery modalities. But let's just touch on those as to why perhaps compression garments and all the other supp supplementary stuff, massage, active recovery, why they are important, but again, why we don't want to invert that pyramid around. So it's like so many things in life. If we don't take care of the basic things, then the complicated things can't do what they're supposed to do so you can get as much massage as you like you can use compression gear you can go and buy yourself fancy supplements but if you aren't taking care of these basics then you are building a house on clay your foundations aren't dug deep enough and you're, you're not in a position for those things to truly make a difference. So we often refer to those things as the one percenters and the five percenters and they do make a difference. Absolutely they do, but they can only make a difference if we are taking care of sleeping well, eating well, making sure we've got enough rest days. Interestingly, when it comes to recovery and recovery modalities and and the more serious you become and the closer you get to sub elite and then elite the supplementary recovery things i feel can reduce the number of rest days that you perhaps need but they won't entirely take away the need for a rest day and i feel like that's where the complementary stuff comes into play. So if you're an amateur athlete that doesn't have lots of time to lie about and recover, it can perhaps reduce the time between high intensity sessions. It can perhaps allow you to do a couple more longer sessions than you otherwise would. So again, it will allow you to do a couple of extra things, but what it will never do is allow you to shortcut that tripod of having some rest, having lots of good quality sleep and eating well. Definitely, and, and my, in my experience and what the science has showed us as well is with all of these supplementary modalities, so the compression garments, the massage and everything, the science is very clear that that is a subjective view. If you feel like that compression garment works for you, 
you will feel like you are recovering more and more. So again, find what works for you. Find what is, 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 is complementing your base of your pyramid, uh, but don't, make, don't invert your pyramid and make that the core or the focus of your recovery. As Lindsay mentioned, bringing your heart rate down slowly after a session is crucial when it comes to your recovery. But your heart rate can also tell you a lot about the way that you are recovering from your training. So many runners get it wrong though. Watch this video next so that you know what the different sessions in your training plan should feel like. Most runners who start working with us are getting number two all wrong. And once we fix it, amazing things start happening in their running and in their recovery.